Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Daniel here with another book review video in this from the bookshelf series. And um, today we are looking at Run the Gauntlet Channel Dash 1942 by Ken Ford. So just to read from the blurb, it says In February 1942, three of the major ships of the German surface fleet, the battlecruisers Scharnhorst and Neisenau and the heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen, stormed out of the harbour at Brest on a dramatic voyage back to Germany. Passing through the Straits of Dover, the ships faced everything the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy could throw at them. In a dramatic rolling battle, the ships managed to sail right under the nose of history's greatest maritime nation to reach the safety of Germany. The daring and brilliantly executed operation humiliated the British forces whose responses had been perfectly anticipated by Hitler. This book tells the complete story of the Channel Dash from the planning through to the repercussions of this unique German victory. So this book is a paperback, it's part of the Osprey Raid series. It was published in 2012 fairly short book. It's only 78 pages long, 79 if you include the um, bibliography and 80 if you include the appendix. So uh, sorry, the index. So not that long at all. It's um, similar to all the other books in the Osprey Raid series. But I really, really enjoy it as I really enjoy all of Osprey's books because of the detail that they go into. Um, so the writing in this isn't too big, it's not too small, I mean where there are quotations it, the font is pretty small but still very legible. Um, like other books in the Osprey series, if you've ever had the pleasure of reading one you'll know exactly what I mean. It's um, punctuated with photographs on virtually every page or every other page. Um, you know, there's a couple of maps in here in true Osprey 3D style. Fantastic. A couple of um, artwork plates also, which are very nice. So, this book sums up the Channel Dash and it looks at how John Horst Nyes now came to be at Brest before looking at the plans for them to break out, the German commanders. But it also focuses on Operation Fuller, the British response to the Channel Dash. Um, and sort of how Britain and Germany work in, on the same plan but coming at it from different areas. So it discusses how the Germans realised that the Street of Dover was a choke point and that the best thing to do would be to transit that street which is only 25-26 miles at its narrowest during daylight when they could see exactly where they're going and you know the Luftwaffe can provide air support overhead and you know can attack any ships which the British put out to try and stop Sean Horse Nice down Prince Eugen and can also help defeat the Aria. The British by contrast thought that the Germans wouldn't transit the street of Dover in daylight and that they would do it under the cover of darkness because darkness would afford them security. So it's interesting in that regard because the Channel Dash really was a series of errors on Britain's part. You know, the, um, they had aircraft on patrol which left at night. Um, submarines which should have been stationed off shore breast were away recharging their batteries. So they missed the German ships slipping out and it wasn't actually until they were in the street of Dover at lunchtime that they realised, hang on, you know, the Germans are breaking out. Um, and then things didn't go all that according to plan. But this book is, well, to the style job, capturing all of that information in very few pages. So one thing that does annoy me is that this book is part of the Raid series. And um, what I mean by that is it's part of the Osprey Raid series. So they've got different series of Osprey publishing. They've got Air Campaign, uh, 
elite forces and this one is raid and raid tends to be sort of engagements which are what is on tinder raids short engagements um hit and run sort of jobs so the titles in the series include things like who dares wins the iranian embassy siege where well that recounts the story of the ses in 1982 you know which you can see the footage available elsewhere on youtube um where they blew out the windows one evening and went in and freed the hostages that were being held captive in the Iranian embassy. There's also um, the Los Banos prison raid, where American paratroopers went in and overpowered Japanese to free the prisoners of war. There's the um, Operation Valkyrie, which mm, debatable, but um, yeah, this is part of that series. And the reason I'm annoyed that it's part of the raid series is because of this book here, Bismarck 1941 by Angus Constam, which is part of Osprey's campaign series. So the campaign series is pretty thin also. It's um this 96 pages, including the index of actual text, it's 93. So you look at approximately 13 pages, 14 pages more. Um, it's exactly the same style with photographs throughout, uh, the map sections, colour plates, uh, sorry, colour painting plates. And it's in very much the same format of you look at the background, then the plans, the commanders, and then the action itself. But what I can't understand with this is why the Bismarck is a campaign book and why the Channel Dash is a raid book. Now, the breakout of the Bismarck was part of the Battle of the Atlantic, which was the longest running campaign of the Second World War. So, for me, she embarked on a raid and the whole dramatic story of what happened with the Bismarck should possibly be classified as a raid. Um, yeah, it's... It just doesn't stack up because I would say the Channel Dash was more important than the sinking of the Bismarck, which I know people are infatuated by the Bismarck and the whole story of it with her breaking out and consult with Prince Oig and transit in the Denmark Strait and on the 24th of May sinking the hood with a salver, you know, captivated by the huge loss of life on board the hood, and then the dramatic chase which culminated on the sort of Bismarck were missing on the eve, well, during the course of 25th of May, being picked up on 26th of May. The attack at the 11th hour on the 26th of May, which, you know, saw the rudder destroyed by a lucky torpedo hit. And then, obviously, the final dramatic battle with King George V, HMS Rodney, and uh, being sunk by torpedoes from Dorsetshire. But the Channel Dash, Arguably was far more significant, you know, the um, because of what the Germans achieved. You know, in one stroke, they brought their ships back to Germany, as the blurb says, directly under the noses of history's greatest maritime nation. You know, it has to be remembered at the time, the Royal Navy was still the world's largest naval power. Um, so they achieved that that victory but at the same time the British scored a strategic victory with it which sounds counterintuitive given that Jim scored a success in moving the ships under their noses but um, effectively what Hitler did because it was on Hitler's orders that the ships were brought back was they gave up having ships on the Atlantic coast but, um, so long as Sean Horst Nyes and Prince Eugen were in the French ports, they were a threat to the Atlantic convoys. By moving them back to Germany, they gave up that threat. So, arguably you could say that this was far more important so far as the conduct of the war was concerned. And with hindsight, we know that you know, after the Channel Dash, no other German raiders, or, and by raiders I mean sort of, Battleships like Sean Horst and Eisenhower, heavy cruisers like Prince Eugen, 
or even pocket battleships like Lulutsa or Ad, um, Admiral Shia ventured out into the Atlantic to raid the convoys. You know, they went to the Baltic and they went to Norway, but never went to the Atlantic. So you could argue that given the Battle of the Atlantic raged until sort of the end of the war in May 1945, the Challenge Dash was far more significant in terms of the outcome and where the ships were and what they did or didn't do than the Bismarck which broke out, tied up a few British resources for nine days, was sunk. I mean, I get that the Bismarck is a great story and that there was a whole host of, well, it was like a boy's own story, really. And obviously you've got the casualty figures which tell their own story and, you know, the best part of two and a half thousand individuals killed. But for me, the Challenge Ash was more significant and therefore I wish it had been for the, um, sort of, the same respect that the Bismarck has been afforded and accorded. But that's just me, you know, that's my thoughts on the matter. It, um, it doesn't take away any from the book. It would have been nice to have had this extra 13, 14 pages, just to go into a little bit more detail. But, you know, I'm not going to complain. This is still a fantastic book. And for me personally, it was very valuable because the Channel Dash wasn't something that I was overly familiar with in that I knew about it, but I didn't know the exact details, so I wasn't fully aware of Operation Fuller and all of those details and of the trials and tribulations that the Germans encountered so during the um, during the dash. So I knew that Scharnhorst hit a mine off the island of Tischling, I believe, um, but I didn't realise that she'd actually hit two and that nice now would also hit one um, and that Prince Eugen had made her way unscathed albeit off the hook of Holland at eight knots but that's by the by. Um, so it was rather valuable in that respect and it also it highlights sort of the bravery of um, sort of the British destroyers, the role of Bomber Command in that and in particular the role of the Fleet Arm. Uh, in particular, uh, eight two. This is going to be bad. I'm going to have to look it up. Eight two five, I think, which was Eugene Esmond's squadron. It's Victor Beach. Sorry, uh, just excuse me one second. Swordfish, DSO, 11, yeah, 825 squadron. Phew. <laughs> hey, I, I like to try and give everyone the credit that they deserve, so it would have pained me if I had said something like 820 squadron and then found out later that it was wrong. So, to save a correction later, it's, um, I hope it can excuse that. But yeah, it goes into the deal of sort of attack by 825 squadron and sort of how they were gallant in what was effectively a futile attack. You know, the, um, there's a quote from, I think it's Captain Brinkman of the Prince Eugen who says that the British are thro throwing their mothball navy. And then when he sees the swordfish approaching, because the swordfish is a biplane, looked like it belonged in the First World War. Um, so. It recounts in respectable detail how 825, against the odds, flew through a hail of flak, dodged the Messerschmitt 109s, the Focke-Wulf 190s, trying to love their attacks and were all shot down and sort of the majority killed. It's, um, it's a quite a harrowing story and it comes across really well in the limited um, number of pages which the stories. Tooling. Um, so 
Yes, if you've got the chance to read this book, I would highly recommend it. It is extremely easy to read, well written. The illustrations in it are fantastic. It's a great book and with it being fairly short, you can get through it rather rapidly. Um, so yeah, if you've had a chance to read it, you know, break it out and read it again. If you haven't read it, grab yourself a copy and do that. Um, you know, they're my thoughts. Please let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. If you've enjoyed this video, hit a like. It'd be great if you could also subscribe to the channel so you don't miss on any updates. And uh, we'll catch you next time for another From the Bookshelf. Until then, thank you.